Hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. This series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we're very fortunate to be hosting Mark Heaton. Mark is a biologist with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and is based out of the Aurora District Office just north of Toronto. He started with MNRF in 1985. Mark is involved with species recovery including peregrine falcon, Atlantic salmon, redside dace, and brook trout. He has worked with many angling and conservation organizations with fisheries enhancement projects over the years including fish culture, habitat rehabilitation, and fishway construction. After the presentation, we'll be opening the floor for a question and answer session. You'll have the option of asking questions directly using your microphone or you can type them in and we'll read them aloud. I'm now going to turn the webinar over to Mark. Thanks, Darla. Today's webinar is on Scotty Boxes, experiences using in-stream incubation, incubation units for Atlantic salmon eggs and in-lake incubation units for trout eggs. The presentation outline is as follows. We'll cover off the Jordan Scotty box as well as other in-stream in incubators, the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Recovery Program and the use of in-stream incubation units the Reserve Beauchene and the use of in-lake incubation of uh, trout eggs and cover off some of the lessons learned over the years that we've been doing this work. For those of you that are not aware of the Scotty boxes, they're referred to as the Jordan Scotty Salmonid Incubator and they're manufactured by Scott Plastics out of Sydney, British Columbia. They were originally developed back in 1980 by Fred Jordan. Since that time, Scotty Plastics has taken on uh, production of these uh, plastic units. They're developed to enhance in-stream incubation of uh, trout and salmon eggs, and they're affectionately known as the Salmon Condominium when it comes to the classroom hatchery program with the Atlantic Salmon Recovery work that we do in Lake Ontario. Two plates make up an inc incubator. These plates uh, come in a variety of different uh, colors that are associated with the hole diameter in the uh, incubation plate itself. So red plates are a little bit smaller hole. They're used for coho salmon, pink and sockeye salmon, as well as trout species. The green plates have a larger hole and they're traditionally used for Chinook salmon. The yellow plates include a screen hole to contain fry and can be used for walleye. We've also had uh, clear units uh, produced in this style and the local kids in the community uh, classroom hatchery program refer to them as the fish jails. Fertilized green eggs or eyed eggs can be used in these incubation units. The eggs are placed on individ into individual cells with the assistance of a loading tray. The image on the right hand side of the screen here has a fisheries technician uh, placing the eggs into that loading tray with the assistance of a feather. 200 cells make up the unit and typically they're uh, deployed in blocks of five units or a thousand eggs uh, buried into the gravel on the upstream side of a riffle in a stream. The Vibert box was originally developed by fisheries researcher Richard Vibert of France and used in 1950. It was later modified by David Whitlock in the 1970s to include an egg incubation compartment. So when we're looking at this plastic unit here, this is the egg incubation compartment at the top and it's got a plastic folding uh, uh, door, uh, so you fill the eggs, uh, put the eggs inside of that compartment. The intent here is for the eggs to hatch in that upper um, egg incubation chamber and drop down as sack fry into the protective nursery area and then escape into the surrounding gravel as fry and eventually emerge as swim up fry. The design is now patented by the International Federation of Fly Fishers as the renamed Whitlock Fiber Box. It's used for a variety of research uh, projects, fisheries enhancement, and educational purposes. It's only available through the International Federation of Fly Fishers. Another one of the in-stream incubators that's been used over the years is the gravel-filled tubes. And it's been used in a variety of different applications. The tubes are made with a plastic or PVC pipe or rigid uh, plastic mesh. Here we have a 4-inch um, ABS pipe with a cap on the bottom and that uh, plastic pipe is surrounded in uh, the window screening, the fiberglass window screening. The bottom image is the screened uh, 
uh, mesh tube with the uh, sock on the upper part of it for capturing uh, the swim up fry as they emerge from the uh, gravel that's inside this plastic filled uh, mesh tube. The, uh, typically you're putting in between 100 to 150 eggs in these tubes. Moving on now from the incubation units and their different types, we'll move into the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Recovery Program. The history of Lake Ontario is very interesting. Salmon, the Atlantic salmon, were one of the most abundant species in Lake Ontario prior to European settlement. The species was considered landlocked into Lake Ontario and used the North Shore as well as South Shore tributaries for uh, reproduction. The first account of this species re was recorded in 1656 by Jesuit missionaries. Later, as the country was settled, salmon were a very important source for food for early settlers in the 1700s and early 1800s. Dams were uh, considered the first cause for decline of the species in Lake Ontario as a result of fragmenting the large lake from all the spawning habitat and nursery habitat in the watersheds that fed into it. The recovery efforts for Atlantic salmon actually began back in the 1860s with the construction of the first government hatchery built by Samuel Wilmot on Wilmot Creek, uh, very close to Newcastle, Ontario. The species unfortunately was declared ex extirpated from Lake Ontario in 1896 with the last specimen just being caught off the uh, Scarborough Bluffs outside of the uh, Toronto area. Our recovery program for uh, the uh, Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon began in 2006. It's a cooperative recovery program led by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. The goal of the program is to restore a self-sustaining population of Atlantic Salmon to Lake Ontario and its tributaries, leading to a sustainable recreational fishery both in Lake Ontario as well as the tributaries that feed into it. We have a specific number of target streams that we focused in on for this recovery program. Of course, when you look at species recovery at the provincial level, when we do native species recovery, it's a fundamental action of Ontario's biodiversity strategy. The Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Recovery Program is built on four pillars. Fish production and stocking, habitat and water quality enhancement, research and assessment, education and outreach. These actions go through and are assisted by a number of program partners and we have over 40 different program partners involved with the program now. We work with three different strains of Atlantic salmon for recovery. We have the Sebago Lake strain from Maine, the La Havre strain from Nova Scotia, and the Lac Saint-Jean strain from Quebec. Our adult returns were first detected in local fishways beginning in 2009. This map depicts the uh, target streams that are in associated with the Atlantic Salmon Recovery Program. The dark blue streams represent those that are being stocked with fry, fingerlings, and yearlings. The light blue streams are those that are focused on for habitat rehabilitation. So currently we have a number of different life stages of Atlantic Salmon and three different strains being stocked into Coburg Brook, Duffins Creek near Pickering, and the Credit River as it flows through Brampton and Mississauga. Our adult brood stock are held at the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources Harwood Fish Culture Station located on Rice Lake. There they produce the eyed eggs that are shipped to other facilities including the Normandale Fish Culture Station which produces a large number of advanced fry for stocking in May, fall fingerlings that are stocked in October, and yearlings that are stocked in April. Community hatcheries run by volunteers are provided by eggs which raise the fish to a fry stage and release into local target streams. And we have a number of clubs associated with the Atlantic Salmon Program, including the Credit River Anglers Association, the Islington Sportsman's Club, Metro East Anglers, and the Bellfountain Community Hatchery. Over 100 classrooms across the Greater Toronto Area raise fry from eyed eggs, and they release those fry uh, into local target streams. The surplus eggs, eyed eggs that we get from the provincial fish culture system are also used for research and stocking. We'll now move on to how in-stream incubators are used with the Atlantic Salmon Recovery Program. 
Since 2008, Ontario Streams, one of our key partners in the program, has been involved with in-stream incubation with IDE Atlantic Salmon Eggs provided by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Whitlock Vibrant Boxes, Scotty Incubators and Gravel Fill Tubes have been used in comparison with direct deposit and injection methods for IDE Eggs. The investigations thus far have focused primarily on the Upper Humber River, just north of Toronto. The Humber River is known historically as one of the important Atlantic salmon streams feeding into Lake Ontario. Incubating Atlantic salmon eyed eggs directly in headwater streams is seen as a potential tool for uh, restoration uh, when it comes to this program. So they've been looking at the different techniques to see which ones work best. What they use as an indicator is the production of fry and fingerlings and the survival at this stage helps them evaluate which ones perform better in terms of methods. Early in the investigation, there were six incubation methods that were tested. Scotty boxes with screens that trapped the fry in position and those Scotty boxes were placed in the gravel. Scotty boxes without screens and again they were placed in the gravel. The Whitlock Vibrant boxes placed in the stream directly in the gravel direct deposit of eggs into gravel and then broadcasting the eggs into the current of the stream. The work with the eyed eggs was done in uh, the January to early May or sorry January to early February period with fry retrieval in May and fingerling surveys in late summer. This is the Upper Humber River. The watershed is about 900 square kilometers in size. The uh, area is uh, basically a 30% forest cover with the dominant uh, land uses uh, associated with agriculture being uh, hay uh, as well as uh, livestock production and some intensive row crops. The uh, western part of the watershed is uh, having the Niagara escarpment passing through it which is a, a significant source of groundwater to the system and then further to the east part of the Upper Humber uh, watershed is the Oak Ridges Moraine which is a large sand and gravel deposit that also provides uh, cold water to the tributaries. The work that we're going to talk about now with Ontario Streams is focused on uh, some private properties in this area uh, being the Coffee Creek Farm, the Stewart property and the Finest property. If you're interested in looking in the, in, on a map, the uh, area is just located west of Highway 50 uh, near the uh, village of Palgrave, Ontario. This is the 2008 results of the uh, incubation study that was performed and they looked at a number of different methods including the direct deposit into gravel, Scotty boxes with and without screens, Scotty boxes placed in the gravel as well as above the gravel tied into the, bed, uh, the bank of the creek, the Whitlock Vibrant boxes in gravel. They even tested out some of the Whitlock Vibrant boxes in a controlled environment in the community hatchery. Unfortunately, the percent survival of uh, stocked eyed eggs to fry stage was uh, relatively poor. The best return was on the Rogers Creek uh, Scotty boxes, uh, which is a different watershed with low uh, sediment. Uh, and basically they got 49% survival for the 600 eyed eggs that were placed into those incubation units. Again, looking at the uh, late summer fingerling production, the numbers here are very low in terms of uh, number of individuals caught per square meter of stream. Now this was replicated in 2009 and similar uh, results were found. So based on the poor outcomes of 2008 and 2009, the methods were refined in 2010 based on the following things they learned. Scotty boxes and Whitlock vibrant boxes without screens could not be monitored for effectiveness, effectiveness in producing fry. There's no way to count what, produce, what comes out of these uh, structures. The direct deposit method of putting the eyed eggs into the current over cobble produced no fry. The method of using screen Scotty boxes was the focus of 2010 with also adding on the additional method of using screen gravel filled tubes. Let's go through a series of photographs showing the uh, deployment of the uh, Scotty boxes. So here we've got that technician that's providing uh, some assistance in getting those eggs into the 200 cells of the loading tray. Once the loading tray has been finished off and checked for uh, quality, the next step is to put the uh, screened Scotty uh, box panel on top 
It is then inverted, and then the second unit is placed on top. Once the two uh, panels are placed together, they're secured using a nylon uh, nut and a stainless steel uh, bolt. Or sorry, a uh, nylon bolt and a stainless steel nut. The uh, Scotty box is then placed in the stream, and the image on the left here shows that Scotty box. This one's actually placed above the gravel and anchored to the uh, bed of the stream, and the position of this one is referred to as being parallel with the current. The image on the right is showing the sediment accumulation in that uh, Scotty box uh, following retrieval of that same unit in May. These are the uh, plastic gravel filled tubes. So here we've got the four inch uh, ABS pipe with uh, a cap that's uh, solvent welded on the bottom. The uh, mosquito mesh or window screening is uh, affixed to the side using um, uh, glue. The, uh, tube is filled with uh, gravel. It's typically one, one and a quarter inch diameter gravel. You can see a few eggs in this uh, unit on the right hand side. The eggs are counted into the tube. Uh, once the tube is uh, back filled with gravel and capped, it's placed into the bed of the stream on its side. And here the image on the right, you can see uh, that tube on the bottom placed in the cobble of the stream and there's a piece of green flagging tape uh, attached to it and there's a good purpose for that. When you look at the next image on the left, the gravel tube has been covered in cobble and now all you have left is the flagging tape sticking out flowing in the current that tells you where your units are, especially when you come back to retrieve them three months later. So the tubes are retrieved in May and it's usually the first or second week of May and we do keep track of the water temperatures to help us predict the best time to pull these things out of the creek. The tube is opened and the fry are counted, and it's both live and dead fry that are counted. So as a result of the 2010 work with 16 Scotty boxes, they found that there is a varying survival rate of between 0.5 to 10.8%. The sediment accumulation in the Scotty boxes was the primary reason for reduced survival. There was little difference in survival when you compared the Scotty boxes in relation to whether the box was parallel or perpendicular to the current. Now when we look at the 18 gravel filled tubes that were used, it resulted in a 24.5% survival of the swim up fry stage. Moving into phase four of the investigation in 2011, Ontario Streams focused on the method of using screened gravel filled tubes placed based on the performance from 2010. This phase included using different densities of eggs per tube and they up the numbers of tubes from 18 to 250. They also solicited the help from PhD students from McGill University to analyze the survival based data based on egg density. This is the results coming from the PhD students. So we've got six different properties here. Chico's, which is located at Highway 9 on the main Humber River, had very poor survival based on the three different scenarios of 50, 75, and 100 eggs per tube. Copy Creek Farm had moderate survival of about 40% for the 50, 75, and 100 uh, egg densities. The Galloway site and the St. Francis site had much higher survival for those eggs at those different densities, and they also looked at density of 150 eggs per tube, and then they had one for 300 over here and what they found was that this situation these locations were the ones that were directly downstream of online ponds. The 2011 survival to swim up fry st straight, uh, stage ranged from 2.5 to 80.3 percent using these gravel filled tubes. The survival did vary between sites and again, the highest survival occurred where the incubation tubes were located downstream of online ponds. In 2012, they continued with the use of the incubation tubes and then also adopted the in-stream incubation system method developed by the Department of Marine Resources in Maine. This method uses a gas-powered water pump and plastic funnels to inject the eyed eggs into the gravel substrate. Survival to fingerling stage was very poor using this technique. The highest fry survivals observed in 2012 were based on the plastic tubes that had a, a 
egg density of 150 eyed eggs per tube. We'll just show a few photographs now of the uh, incubation tubes being placed in the stream. So the image on the left hand side of the screen is the uh, channel uh, that's been modified. The uh, volunteers will rake out the um, uh, trench uh, and place the gravel tubes in the trench on their side and then uh, backfill with the cobbles over top. And then uh, following in May, those gravel tubes are extracted and the fry are counted. So we've got some of those Atlantic salmon fry in the image on the right hand side of the screen. There's a lot to this image here that I need to explain. This is the in-stream injection system and there is a video available on YouTube called Penham River uh, Egg Injection. The gas power pump uh, that is used is here on the uh, bank of the stream. It's a one inch uh, gas powered pump that is connected to a garden hose. The garden hose is connected to this uh, steel pipe. Uh, this steel pipe is placed inside a funnel. So we've got a four inch uh, segment of PVC pipe. Underwater, we've got a four inch to one inch reducer going to a 14 inch uh, segment of uh, PVC pipe. It's cut on an angle. These uh, funnels are driven by water injection down into the gravel of the uh, stream. So here's a, uh, a funnel that's in the correct position for depositing the eggs and the technician is counting out the eggs and placing them into that funnel. Once the eggs settle into that one inch tube, it's very uh, cautiously pulled out and the eggs are left behind inside the gravel substrate of the uh, riffle. When we look at the 2012 results, we have three different sites here. So we've got the Galloway property, which is just directly downstream of an online pond. The uh, different scenarios that were run here were 150 eggs per tube up to 500 eggs per tube. The number of eggs here we're working with is approximately 18,000 eggs. The percent survival for Galloway using the 150 eggs per tube was 55.8%. They got 60% with the 300 eggs per tube scenario. Uh, St. Francis, again, uh, directly downstream of the, um, of the online pond, 71% with 150 eyed eggs. Three, uh, with the 300 eggs scenario, 58.1%. Uh, the St. Francis site is, uh, this uh, third site is actually upstream of the online pond. And you can see here that percent survival to fry stage uh, was much less. When we look at the August electrofishing results where the, the uh, technicians will go back into that same uh, reach and electrofish for um, juvenile Atlantic salmon, they'll be counting all of the uh, fish captured that are under uh, 100 millimeters as, uh, as uh, summer fingerlings. So in this case with Galloway, they uh, captured 31 uh, juvenile Atlantic salmon and, and one uh, older fish from probably the year before. Their um, Atlantic salmon individuals per square meter was uh, 0.2, which is a good return rate, we believe. As compared to the uh, St. Francis Center, uh, which had poor returns, when you look at the Atlantic salmon produced per square meter, it's about one-tenth of that. So there's an important message here with the uh, implications of online ponds. In, typically, we don't think of them as very good, but in this case, uh, they are helping out with Atlantic salmon incubation in the tubes by uh, holding up some of the uh, fine sediment that's moving through the system. Uh, within the uh, 2012 work, they also looked at a five-year um, synthesis of the results. Uh, so here we have the uh, legend at the bottom, uh, just describing the different uh, scenarios, different methods. So we've got Scotty boxes, the best fry ever seen for that five-year period was the Scotty boxes in the Upper Humber was 10.8%. The Scotty boxes in the Credit River, Rogers Creek, best seen for fry production was uh, 49%. And then the best fry production uh, overall was with the in-stream uh, plastic uh, tubes with 71% uh, fry production being the best performance. When we look at the maximum average survivorship of the um, uh, IDEG incubation methods for the month of August uh, using Atlantic salmon per meter squared as the indicator here. Our best performing situation was the uh, uh, plastic tubes, gravel plastic tubes with uh, 0.2 Atlantic salmon uh, fingerlings per square meter. And just as a comparative, we've got uh, Islington Sportsman's Club fry stalking 
where they'll produce uh, 20 to 25,000 fry. And in those areas where we go back and uh, monitor the site for uh, fingerling production some four months later, in that area, they were producing about 0.1 uh, fingerling per square meter. So now, now move to the 2013 locations. Uh, so in 2013, they started focusing in on these uh, online ponds. Uh, so again, we're in the Upper Humber. Um, we're just uh, north of Highway 9 with the St. Francis Centre. Uh, they've got an online pond here. They looked at uh, two locations, uh, one directly downstream of the online pond, one located about 200 meters downstream. Uh, same with the uh, Galloway property here, directly downstream of the structure, the online pond, and then one located a bit further downstream. And then we've got another private uh, online pond here. Uh, it's actually a micro hydro facility in the Upper Humber. And uh, they've got uh, some of the incubators located directly downstream of the structure and then uh, a few hundred meters uh, further downstream. So in terms of the spring 2013 fry Fry survivorship using that incubation tube stocking sites with these different scenarios involving online ponds. What they found was that as you go further downstream for the dam, the survivorship was actually less. So here we've got the results of the online pond of the main Humber close to the dam, uh, roughly 25% survival. But as you move downstream, the survival dropped off. Here, the St. Francis Center again, you know, 40, 43% survival directly downstream of the structure survival's uh, diminished as you move downstream. And with the uh, Galloway property, uh, similarly, but still good survival on uh, both scenarios uh, with that uh, online pond. So between 2008 and 2013, seven incubation methods were tested. They tested Scotty boxes with screens, with them placed directly in the gravel. They used the Scotty boxes without screens directly in the gravel. They also used Scotty boxes placed above the gravel the, uh, and anchored to the uh, bank of the stream or into the woody debris of a pool. The uh, Whitlock Vibrant boxes were used uh, in gravel incubation. Uh, they also looked at direct deposit of eggs into the gravel, uh, broadcasting the eggs into the current of the stream with the intention of having those eggs settle into the interstitial spaces of the cobble and they also tried out the in-stream incubation system. The key findings here is that the screened gravel filled incubation tubes were the most effective in producing spring fry. The screened Scotty boxes were moderately effective where in-stream sediment loading was low, being the case with Rogers Creek and the Credit River. Deploying in-stream incubation units below online ponds improves the survival of eyed eggs to the swim-up stage. If you're interested in learning more about this, you can go directly to the Ontario Streams website and they've got a, a page there entitled Studies and you can download all the uh, technical reports of the past five years. Those reports go into a lot more detail than what I've just covered off here. Now moving into the component of the Atlantic Salmon uh, Program for Lake Ontario, we've got a lot of interest in getting people involved. Uh, so we have a good outreach and education program and one of the uh, big pieces of that is the classroom hatchery program that we do with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and local schools within the greater Toronto area and beyond. So this is a very important part of our recovery program and in it we use the Scotty boxes in the classroom hatcheries for students to experience the development of the eyed eggs into free swimming fry. There's no better structure to cover up having a kid watch a fish hatch from an egg right in front of them using the Scotty box. This acts as a learning conduit for teaching biodiversity, water quality, mass, and natural, natural history. So in 2007, we began the program with 21 classrooms across the greater Toronto area. And as of 2013, there were over 100 schools and outdoor education centers involved, including the Toronto Zoo. We had 1,325 students engaged in 2013 and we're expecting more in 2015 with over 110 schools ready to receive eggs over the coming weeks. Just a few photographs showing what this is all about. So we operate with 100 eyed Atlantic salmon eggs and here we have uh, uh, Chris Robinson from the uh, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. He's our coordinator for the Atlantic Salmon Program and he's loading up those eggs uh, into the loading tray which will be moved into the uh, clear plastic uh, screen Scotty box. 
the eggs are transferred into that Scotty box and uh, then secured. And then they're placed inside the uh, classroom hatchery. And the classroom hatchery consists of about a 25 gallon aquarium. And the aquarium has a small pump in it that pumps the water out to a chiller unit. And it's usually a 1 tenth horsepower chiller unit that we get from uh, Big L's Aquarium Services in Toronto. Uh, there's a biological filter that's also uh, tied in with the uh, classroom hatchery. Here's a complete system here. So we've got the uh, chiller unit at the back, the biological filter here. The aquarium is wrapped with uh, insulation to help conserve energy. And we've also got the program materials here for the Atlantic Salmon Recovery Program, including life cycle information and more uh, information about the history of the species, as well as all the project partners that are helping out with recovery efforts. Once the eggs have developed into free swimming fry, they're released from the uh, Scotty box and then they're uh, transported by the kits to the uh, local target stream and released. Typically this is happening in the last few weeks of May and early June and we'll get the entire uh, classroom out with the teacher uh, learning about the stream, uh, learning about benthic invertebrates and helping with the uh, cleanup of the stream and releasing their fry. And in terms of survival, we've had a variety of different scenarios with the program. We've had zero survival when it comes to these units as a result of technical errors. Somebody pulled a plug and the aquarium got too warm. And then we've had situations where they've had 90% survival to swim up uh, stage. So it's, uh, it's really been helpful having the Scotty boxes as part of the classroom hatchery program uh, because it enhances the survival to the uh, swim up fry stage as compared to traditionally just putting the eggs into the gravel of the aquarium. And when you position that uh, clear plastic Scotty incubator up against the glass of the aquarium, th it allows the kids to see everything. They can see the eyes, uh, they can see the uh, eggs hatch right in front of them, they can see the little alvins uh, wiggling away in the uh, compartment and gradually as that uh, yolk sac absorbs, uh, they can see the coloration changes happening with the, uh, with the fry. So now we're going to move over to the work that's been done at La Reserve Beauchene in Quebec. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with La Reserve Beauchene, it's about a 50,000 acre privately operated fishing and hunting destination in Temiskaming, Quebec. It supports 40 lakes, with the largest lake being Lac Beauchene itself, which is about 15 miles long. It supports a variety of species, including walleye, smallmouth bass, northern pike, whitefish, lake trout, and brook trout. Many of the brook trout lakes that they have are managed for put and take fisheries and are stocked annually under license issued by the Quebec government. Four of the lakes that they have are managed for, as wild no-kill fisheries and these are self-reproducing uh, brook trout that rely on uh, one spawning shoal for that entire chain of four lakes. The past history of gravel extraction upstream of this uh, gravel shoal has resulted in diminished uh, reproductive capacity for the chain of lakes. This is uh, the flashing yellow here is the Tag Taggart Lake, now known as uh, Watrous Lake in memory of Richard Watrous, uh, one of the key people that started up uh, Lab Reserve Beauchene. He uh, passed away a couple of years ago. This is the uh, main uh, Lake Beauchene here, which is about 15 miles long. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about this work. Uh, Basically, we do the egg collection here for the adult brook trout, and then we incubate the eggs in the main uh, part of the lake close to the outlet. So this outlet uh, drains into the Beauchene River, which eventually goes into uh, the Ottawa River, and it's uh, a good-sized river with a high gradient. The use of the Scotty boxes began in the fall of 1997 when uh, Reserve Beauchene was uh, looking into ways to improve the uh, Taggart or Watrous Lake uh, brook trout uh, population. The uh, fertilized green eggs were collected from that Watrous Lake uh, brook trout and incubated using the boxes. And the boxes were buried into the spawning shoal in uh, gravel adjacent to the reds that had been dug by the adult fish. The boxes were retrieved the following May and found to have limited success. And there was problems with um, freezing, uh, if you're not directly over top of that trickle of groundwater coming into the shoal, your, your uh, eggs will freeze. 
and there was no way of really detecting what your fry production was because if they did uh, manage to survive, they would escape into the surrounding gravel and there's no way to count them. So over the years, the methods were changed to improve survival and maximize uh, production. Uh, we began with uh, collecting more eggs. Uh, so traditionally, we get a permit from the Quebec government for a collection of 12,000 uh, brook trout eggs. And we use uh, 30 screened boxes, the screened Scotty boxes. It's uh, they're set up as two eggs per cell with 400 uh, eggs per box. The incubation occurs in uh, Lac Beauchene itself in seven meters of water at the outflow of the lake where it transitions to the Beauchene River. Ten incubators are secured to a four meter long vertical PVC pipe held in place with a rope, an anchor, and a float. And there's a, a lot of um, uh, a lot of time spent trying to figure out the best way to incubate these in a lake environment. Uh, we did try incubating at the inlets to the lake coming from the surrounding creeks and we found that uh, there was a lot of organic sediment moving uh, into the incubators over the course of the six month incubation period and we found so far that the, uh, the incubation at the outlet of the lake is one of the best performing uh, situations. One of the considerations uh, that you need to keep in mind is that uh, wave action, uh, you want to keep that to a minimum. So using a small bay that's sheltered from the predominant westerly winds is important. We've also uh, gone into looking at lake trout eggs. So we've been fertilizing some lake trout eggs based on collections out of the uh, main Beauchene Lake and incubated with the uh, same Scotty boxes. So just go through a few photographs here and uh, a lot of this work is really um, based on volunteer assistance and our primary volunteer that's been helping out, a uh, volunteer organization helping out has been the Metro East Anglers. Uh, so they come and help with the uh, collection of the adult fish and the uh, collection of the eggs, setting up the eggs into the incubation units and the uh, fry uh, release uh, in the spring. So here we have uh, one of the volunteers loading the uh, Scotty uh, loading tray uh, two eggs per cell. In this case, it's the uh, lake trout eggs that are being loaded. And he's using a turkey baster, uh, which is really helpful for controlling the eggs uh, as they go in two by two into each of these little cells along this line here. And then if sometimes you have three pop out, four pop out, you use the feather here to help move those eggs around. Here's a completed uh, loading tray, and this is the older loading tray that was available back in uh, the mid-2000 period. Um, and again, it's lake trout eggs, and you can just see the feather being used to uh, manipulate a single egg. So this incubator will be set up with uh, 400 uh, green eggs. It takes quite a few volunteers and uh, quite a few nights of hard work to put 12,000 uh, eggs into 30 incubation units. So we typically have a team of volunteers of six to eight individuals. So here you can see that they're placing the eggs into the uh, uh, loading uh, trays using the turkey baster here. Uh, we used, used uh, ketchup bottles in the past and we've got uh, the feathers that are used for moving the eggs around and then we've got the screened green Scotty box here which will be used for transferring the eggs into once the uh, loading tray is complete. The next morning, the uh, Scotty boxes, they, well, basically they're held overnight in a cooler full of water. Uh, they're never left out of the water for very long. The next morning, we take them out to that uh, bay that feeds into the Beauchene River, and we position ourselves in that seven meters of water and attach the uh, Scotty boxes uh, to the um, PVC pipe at about uh, 30 to 40 centimeter increments. And we use the nylon zip ties for that. We found that they're very effective over a six month period in terms of uh, staying in place and not breaking. Uh, we haven't lost any incubation units as a result of uh, using the uh, PVC pipe and the um, uh, zip ties. Uh, we have lost uh, units in the past as a result of the uh, flotation. So it's an important consideration when you're using a flotation in this scenario, such as a Javix jug or an antifreeze bottle, is to uh, rinse it out, clean it, uh, and then fill it with the expansion foam and then cap it. Uh, because six months underwater with these um, uh, flotation devices, you'll find that they do fill up with water and they can sink. And that's not very good retrieving a set of incubators from seven meters of water. So here we have the incubation unit set up. We've got two strings here. 
uh, set up. So we've got some of those yellow units that are in place, and we've got some of the green units with the screen on. And uh, here we're using uh, the uh, braided poly rope. Uh, it's really good knot strength. Uh, we've never had any knot failures. The first year we did it, uh, we used some of that yellow, yellow polypropylene rope, and we had some issues with that. So one of the recommendations is to go with that white uh, braided poly. And uh, interesting, keep in mind, is that in the fall, uh, October, you're placing these uh, uh, strings in position and you're placing those flotations so they're just below the water level. And the reason for this is that the lake is lowest in the fall. And when you come back in May to retrieve your incubators, the lake level can be two, three, four feet higher, just as a result of uh, spring snow melt. So we have these uh, floats that are always close to the surface, within three or four feet, and uh, we managed to grab them with either a rake or uh, some other type of extraction uh, tool. And uh, from there, we uh, take them back, uh, disconnect the, uh, the nuts and bolts, and then start counting the fry. So here's a Scotty box, and you can see it's got the mosquito window screening uh, attached to it. Um, and then we've got a couple of brook trout fry. Uh, so in a really good situation, you're producing quite a few fry. In this case, uh, we're probably a couple hundred fry that are produced out of this one incubation unit. Uh, you can see that uh, the dead eggs and dead fry that didn't develop are here. And you can also see a little bit of saprolignia fungus around the eggs. And what we've been finding is that uh, where you do get a fungus outbreak, it can overtake even live eggs during the development period. And you can lose an entire uh, Scotty box as a result of the uh, fungus. So one of the recommendations is to always disinfect the units before you use them the following year. Once the fry are uh, released from the egg incubation and counted, uh, we then uh, take them uh, back to the uh, watcher's lake and release the fry into the uh, same habitat as where the uh, native fry, uh, naturally produced fry, are being produced. Uh, so this is uh, near shore with lots of uh, cover from the uh, cedar trees that have fallen into the, uh, the shoreline. And this is just a picture here showing the brook trout fry, and they'll be feeding in a matter of a uh, couple days. So in terms of the results from the work at uh, Reserve Beauchamp, we found that the average brook trout survival to fry stage for the past five years is about 12.1%. Keeping in mind, we're using green eggs, and between the time of setup to time of retrieval, it's six months in the lake. The survival ranged from zero to 71% within the individual boxes. Uh, we have had a really good survival for lake trout in the three years that we've done it. Uh, so the average survival to fry stage for lake trout for that period of 2010 to 2012 is 26.7%. And one of the biggest issues we've encountered with this technique is the fungus development during the incubation period. Just going over some of the lessons learned. So screened gravel filled plastic tubes perform very well for incubating Atlantic salmon eyed eggs in the stream. Performance is better when the tubes are located below the online ponds. And this is within uh, 10 to 20 meters of that online pond. As you go further downstream, the uh, performance diminishes. The uh, Scotty boxes can perform moderately well in streams where fine sediment loading is low. The Scotty boxes can also incubate green, fertilized brook trout and lake trout eggs in a lake environment, provided there's sufficient current during the incubation period. That current is really important. Some of the practical tips that we'd like to convey to those people that might be interested in this technique in the future is to thoroughly clean and disinfect the incubation boxes before use. Fill the floats with expansion foam. Nylon bolts and stainless steel nuts are best for securing the Scotty plates together. We have used different uh, nuts and bolts and always had problems with either rust or the bolts coming undone during the incubation period. The braided white poly rope and nylon zip ties are the best way to secure the incubation units to the vertical uh, anchor line. And make sure you locate those incubation strings where there's no wave action or very little wave action. I'd like to thank the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry for their support over the years with working with the different types of incubation units and the Atlantic Salmon Recovery Program. Our partners with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters have been instrumental in getting the program uh, moving along at a very good pace with lots of different partnerships. 
Ontario's Dreams is an awesome uh, stewardship organization that we work with and they're the ones that are out there on a minus 20 degree day putting the Atlantic salmon eggs into the stream. The uh, Metro East anglers have been very helpful providing volunteers with the work at uh, Reserve Beauchene and we also like to thank the folks at La Reserve Beauchene in Temiskim in Quebec. That's it and uh, thank you very much and if you have any questions I can take those now. Thank you so much, Mark. That was excellent. A really great overview of, of the various programs and the successes and challenges that you've had. It's, it's quite impressive. Thank you. You're welcome. So as Mark said, we'll now open the floor to questions. Uh, to ask a question, you can use your webinar control panel, which is the little gray box you should be seeing in your upper right hand portion of your screen. If the box is minimized, just hit the orange arrow and that will enlarge it. Um, if you're using the audio of your computer, you can raise your hand, figuratively speaking, by pressing the yellow uh, hand icon that has a green arrow on it. And then we can unmute you so that you can ask your question directly to Mark. Or you also have the option of typing in your question on the control panel, and Michelle will read it aloud for you right now. Okay, I've got a couple of people with So we'll give everyone a few minutes. Oh, I've got a couple. Right. Hand, I've got a couple hand raised already, so I'm going to start with um, Craig Purchase. I'm going to unmute you right now. There you can go. you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Um, I'm here at Memorial, but I've been volunteering with the Salmonid Association of Eastern Newfoundland for the past few years, and we've used a lot of these Scotty boxes, and actually. Uh, this year we put out 125,000 salmon eggs in these things. So that, that was 125 plates, so a lot of work. Uh, we've had marginal success, I think, although our ability to monitor that is, uh, is limited. But first question I had, there was a mention that you can't uh, monitor fry production unless they're screened. I would have been under the impression if you opened the box in, let's say, May or something or another, uh, a successfully hatched egg would have an empty cell, but something that didn't hatch, the dead egg would still be in there. So uh, I always was under the impression you could gauge hatch, hatch and emergent success by looking at how many uh, uh, empty cells you had in the plate. Is there any comment on that? Uh, it's it's one of the it's definitely possible to do it that way, but the reliability isn't there. So uh, once that Alvin leaves the incubator and goes into the gravel substrate, you don't know uh, what happens to it after that point. Uh, yes, of course. So we're trying to find out exactly what's produced uh, from the incubation unit uh, using the screening to uh, help control that situation. So would you agree that you could fairly reliably get like um, uh, hatch success and emergence from the box from these things, but of course you don't know what happens to them after? Yeah, so you'd be more measuring hatch success than uh, swim up, swim up fry production. Okay. Uh, ne next question related to that: We have been putting out um, newly fertilized eggs. And I noticed with the salmon work, you were putting out eyed eggs. Do you, you obviously the, they're they're in the river longer if you put out newly fertilized ones? Uh, but do you see any fundamental problem in that? Uh, well, when you're working with eggs, the eyed egg stage is one of the tougher stages to work with. It's a little bit more resilient to being handled, and you know you've got um, less chances of mortality post that point in terms of. Um, the uh, egg development. You're also not working with any what we refer to as bullets, and those are eggs that are not fertilized. Uh, so those can become fungus during the course of the incubation period. The uh, green eggs, um, they're good for the first 24 hours post fertilization, and then they start becoming more sensitive to handling. So when we're doing work with the brook trout and lake trout, we we'll always try to get them into the incubators and into the lake within 24 hours of the eggs being fertilized. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. I mean, we, we don't keep them to the eyed stage because we have no facility. The whole point of trying these Scotty boxes uh, was that we didn't have to have facilities to incubate eggs. So they all get in the river within 24 hours. But yeah. these are all near St. John's, and one of the problems we have here is there's hardly any gravel. 
so we get these, the, they're not actually buried, we half bury them more or less. What we've actually started to do is uh, embed like those plastic blue milk crates, you know what the, like the milk yep. comes in, in the riverbed in summer, we stick a soccer ball, soccer ball sized rock in it, and then during November when the eggs go out, you basically have five of the Scotty box plates bolted together will fit down in one of those things, and then we put a couple rocks on top of it. Yeah. Well, we we can't we can't get them below the stream bed level because there's just not enough gravel. We with picks and shovels, we can't get them down deep enough. Uh, but we lose a lot to in floods, and I worry uh, that we lose a lot of eggs to freezing of the ones that don't get washed away. And I know uh, a lot of them we they're, they're silted up and and mud up and everything so much that I think we actually get quite poor hatch success. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I I I see that you didn't do that well with them either. I'm aware of the report, but I, I I'm not sure what we can change moving forward in the future. Yeah, in each situation, you're going to get some different things that you have to deal with. So it sounds like you're going to have bedrock system with a, a little bit of coarse sediment moving through. Um, I don't know if you've got the uh, opportunity to investigate whether there's any feeder streams coming into that river that you can. Uh, deploy these Scotty boxes and have a little bit more control over this situation. Is yeah, we've that, uh, we've tried everywhere. Basically, places that are uh, the bigger stretches of the stream is too deep. We can't get the things in in November, but then we get into the little places and they dry up in February. I'll let other people ask some questions, but I had one more quick one. You, I didn't know they existed, but you showed a clear Scotty box that in like in the classrooms with a screen on it. Does that come right? I didn't know the company made them like that. Yeah, yeah. You just call up the company and ask them for the clear units with the uh, cross hatch across the hole. So, you know, those 200 cells have got 200 holes, and they, they they put a little plastic X across the hole to trap the fry in. Um, they call it the uh, in the yellow form, they call it the walleye unit. I've never used it for walleye, uh, but in the clear form, we use it for the classroom hatcheries, and it's just it works great. Yeah, that's fab. That would be good in my lab for experimental purposes. Yeah. Good. So just a just a reminder that uh, we're with the Atlantic salmon program. Uh, we don't have adults uh, coming back where we're stripping them and uh, producing fertilized green eggs. We're operating with broodstock that tend to have a, a little surplus of eyed eggs uh, during the production cycle, so we are taking advantage of that when it comes to the use of these uh, incubators. If you uh, would like to try the uh, gravel tubes, they're a, a great technique. Uh, you may be able to buy gravel. Uh, from local landscape supply companies and uh, just prep yourself in advance and then uh, place those on the bed of the stream. Uh, it may work a little bit better for you. Yeah, the, uh, the, these fish, the, the adults are in a river about five hours away and they're taken out of the fish ladder and held and then they, they're stripped and the eggs get put on the bus, literally, grab, prior to being fertilized and they arrive here within six or seven hours and uh, we fertilize them here and then put them in the Scotty boxes. We have good fertilization success and everything like that, but uh, but we have trouble keeping the boxes in the river and we have trouble with them freezing and we have trouble with silt. Okay, well thank you very much. All right, I'm gonna mute you now, Craig, and then we have one more hand raised and then we've got a bunch of um, typed questions. So Margaret Barube, I'm gonna unmute you. Here we go, Margaret, go ahead. No, you're very, very far. I don't know if there's any questions. We're getting, we're getting some feedback. Is there any way, Margaret, sorry, you can type your question? And I'll ask for you, sorry. There's technologies is always fun, so we'll see if Margaret can type the question. Oh, perfect. Oh, oh, she doesn't have questions. Her, her hand was just raised. Okay, good. Um, okay, so the first question I see is from Ben um, Schoenwill. I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce every name properly, but he says, can you define what an online pond is? Uh, yes, okay, so uh, picture a stream segment, like a, 
a small stream three or four meters wide. It may be 15 kilometers long. And what we have in southern Ontario is a long history of dam construction where these uh, dams were built for a variety of purposes, either for uh, uh, lumber production, uh, grist mill, or uh, textiles. And then in the upper part of the watershed in the smaller reaches, um, the agricultural community would have had these ponds created where they dam up a, a creek and they'll use it for irrigation purposes for either crops or uh, livestock. So when we talk about an online pond, it is on a stream and somebody's uh, put a berm across the valley and they've got some sort of concrete uh, uh, control structure, so we call that an online pond. Uh, we do spend a lot of time with our partners in the habitat rehabilitation component of the Atlantic Salmon Program with uh, removing these online ponds or mitigating them through uh, construction of fishways or bypass channels. Okay, great. Uh, Roland LeBlanc has a question. Um, he actually put two, so I'll, I'll, I'll pose both of them to you, but I can repeat it if you want afterwards. Uh, the first part is, can you quantify spawning habitat quality using gravel-filled tubes? And then secondarily, can you quantify hatching success with the gravel tubes and a sock? Uh, so the quantification of using the gravel-filled tubes with a sock is, is not something that our partners uh, have looked at uh, in terms of the uh, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters or Ontario Streams. It was done by um, uh, John uh, Fitzsimons from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. He used to work at the Canadian Centre for Inland Waters in Burlington. So he actually created that uh, adaptation. If you look up uh, John, Dr. John Fitzsimons on the internet, just Google him. Um, and if, if you need help getting his name, you can just email me. Uh, but he's got a report now out on uh, compensation projects uh, involving uh, the use of incubation units. And that's one of the units that's highlighted. It uh, came out this past May. In terms of the other aspect of the question, if you don't mind uh, repeating that uh, First yeah, question. first part was quantifying spawning habitat quality using the tubes, and then secondarily, quantify hatching success. Right, so we can quantify hatching success based on the production of fry, so I think we've covered that off in some of the uh, results that are presented. The aspect of uh, spawning substrate and the quality of that substrate, uh, that's something we'll probably be looking at in the future with doing some uh, sediment analysis uh, during the course of uh, the incubation period. Uh, we do have uh, our uh, uh, spawning areas uh, uh, relatively well known for the upper Credit River and the upper Humber River as well as uh, Duffins Creek and we're basically using uh, gravel size and stream velocity and stream size as the indicators for that uh, those areas that are supposed to be good for uh, Atlantic salmon spawning. Excellent. Uh, next question is from Jessica Gideon. And uh, I believe it's probably answered by now So she, because she's asking, where did you purchase the clear Scotty boxes? But she would have typed that before you answered that for, um, for Craig. So we'll move on. So Anita Doucette um, says, we seem to have lower egg mortality when placing the incubators out of the substrate. So it's not really a question. It's a comment, I guess. Uh, it's very, uh, it's one of the things that we noticed with uh, Rogers Creek. Uh, site was at that uh, incubation uh, area was above the bed of the stream. Uh, it was held in place with uh, cobbles. Uh, so we've also experienced that improved uh, incubation success based on a stream that has very low uh, uh, sediment in terms of uh, uh, bed load. Okay, next question is from Michelle Lavery. And I'll just make a note. I just noticed that she's actually already tweeted that this was a great webinar <laughs> already on Twitter. Um, anyway, so she says, you mentioned that you put the Scotty boxes in the rivers in January to February when eggs are eyed. How do you get them in the river? Is there a lot of ice formation? How are they buried in the gravel? Uh, right. So uh, we've had a number of years uh, uh, doing this. And we cross our fingers come January that we're not going to be dealing with temperatures that are like this morning of minus 24. Um, so the technicians will go out and scope out the areas uh, that are targeted for the incubation units and find the open water. And uh, we hope that uh, they'll remain open uh, when the eggs are ready to go in. We do have the ability to hold the eggs back at lower temperatures. So 
in the hatchery environment, they're incubated at six to eight degrees Celsius. But in the once we get the eggs, we try to chill them down to one to two degrees, so that we've got a longer window in which to put them into the creek. Uh, so we'll slow them down, and then once we have open water to work with, and we've got the volunteers set up and the sites all figured out, then uh, then they'll get into the creek. So there is a challenge there with uh, doing this work in January, February. Uh, but we've got a, a great bunch of volunteers, and they're set up with uh, all the necessary safety equipment, and uh, we've managed to get along. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Guillaume Dauphin asks, what is the next stage of the Atlantic Salmon Rehabilitation Program? With the zero plus survival and mm -hmm. one plus that survives, it, or that survive, it seems you would need to have a huge number of incubators throughout the different catchments to get some adults and then a sustainable population. Right. So the work that we've just presented about the artificial incubation units are just a small fraction of what actually goes into those tributaries of Lake Ontario. So the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry has two fish culture stations that are involved with the program. Harwood Fish Culture Station has all of the adult fish, and I think there's five different year classes uh, in the hatchery environment with three different strains of fish. And then we have Normandale Fish Culture Station that just went through a... Um, a large capital upgrade that's producing somewhere in the order of uh, 450,000 uh, spring fingerlings, uh, 200,000, 250,000 fall fingerlings, and somewhere in the order of 100 to 125 uh, yearlings. So the uh, returns that we're seeing are, are based on uh, pr predominantly the, uh, the hatchery reared fish that are being stocked. It's very difficult for us to uh, see adult returns based on uh, eyed egg or um, uh, fry stocking, but it does happen once in a while. Hopefully that uh, helps out with that question. Okay. Uh, Michelle Lavery has another question. How do you know the open water is the ideal place to eggs uh, to place the eggs in terms of hydrology, etc.? Usually the fish spawn at the heads of riffles in very specific spots. Hmm. Okay, so the, um, the incubators that were placed in uh, Lac Beauchain uh, we're beside a dam and we have uh, knowledge of the hydrology of that system in terms of the annual uh, lake level fluctuation and the discharge of the river and we again we tried different scenarios with uh, placing the incubation units in the lake in seven meters of water directly below the discharge of a creek coming in uh, so we know that the creeks are low in in the fall uh, and uh, the discharge is much higher in the spring and that's when they're carrying the uh, organic load. Um, so we, we did learn through that that uh, the hydrology is important. Uh, we also learned that the um, lake effects associated with uh, uh, wave action and ice are equally important and you have to be uh, very careful in how you select those sites for the uh, in-lake incubation. So again, uh, seven meters has worked well. You want the incubators positioned about a meter off the bottom of the lake and about two meters below the surface of the lake. So that's why we're using that four meter long uh, PVC uh, piece of pipe to anchor them in position. And uh, that's that's what we've evolved into in terms of the best, uh, best scenario for producing brook trout and lake trout. The current characteristics moving through that bay are similar to what you'd have for uh, water moving through uh, a riffle. Okay, great. Um, Anita Doucette does uh, want to know if you could repeat where to get the clear incubator. So I guess some people miss that. Oh, okay. Uh, the clear incubators are available through Scott Plastics. So uh, you can just Google them on the internet for Scotty Plastics out of uh, British Columbia. Okay. Um, Jennifer Nafziger, I've got your hand, your hands raised, so I'm going to unmute Jennifer. Jennifer, go ahead. Jennifer, are you there? <laughs> oh, Jennifer didn't mean to have herself. She was, <laughs> she was just typing. Um, I think that was her new baby crying in the background. Um, Okay, let me just make sure I've cleaned up everything. Um, Bruce Smith asks, have you tried placing the mesh tubes filled with gravel for trout in springs or the outflow from springs where sediments would be low? Uh, no, we haven't tried that. 
One of the uh, things that you have to keep in mind with the Atlantic salmon producing fry is, is that you want to try to match the thermal regime of the stream so that the fry are coming out of the incubation or coming out of the gravel at the same time as the creek is starting to come alive in the spring with insect production. So the trouble with uh, taking Atlantic salmon eggs and putting them into a spring uh, that's maybe six or eight degrees Celsius is that you're uh, moving forward the development of the fry and they may come off uh, sooner than you want in terms of the insect supply that uh, comes about the second week of May. So we try to try to finely tune the um, incubation of the eggs so that you match uh, nature rather than uh, uh, producing the fry too, too early in the season. Right. Mark, the specs for the construction of the graveled filled screen tubes, is that included in the technical reports from Ontario Streams or the one from uh, John Fitzsimmons? Um, there's uh, some technical uh, points in the Ontario Streams documents, yep. Great. We have one more question uh, that I have right now from Jennifer Nafziger again. Um, have you tried explaining better survival of salmon eggs below in stream ponds as the result of higher temperatures? Uh, so during the incubation period, we don't get the higher temperatures uh, downstream of the structures. So the incubation is occurring between January and uh, May, and uh, during that period, uh, you don't get a lot of solar radiation that's going to be warming up the uh, stream significantly. If the incubation period was uh, between May and September, you'd definitely see that effect of online ponds on, on stream temperature. Okay, I've got another question just pop up from Michelle Lavery. Have you measured other habitat variables in your streams, such as dissolved oxygen, et cetera? Uh, the measures, and you'll find them in the, uh, in the technical reports. You'll find some of the uh, parameters that have been measured have been turbidity, uh, based on using a handheld turbidity unit. Uh, there's some temperature information there from using the digital uh, temperature sensors. Uh, we're also looking now at, uh, next step is, is looking at uh, velocity and more so characterizing the sediment that's causing the problem. So there'll probably be uh, bed load samplers or some form of uh, structure that's used for um, uh, measuring the bed load during the uh, spring freshet. Okay, I'm not showing any more hands raised or questions right now. You've certainly... Uh had a popular webinar because that was one of the longer uh, Q&A sessions that we've had. So I'll just maybe give people a few more seconds if they're gonna type any questions. Yes, and I would just second that. A huge thank you, Mark. A really informative presentation and a really informative question and answer session. Well, thank you very much for hosting. It's been a pleasure. I do have Jennifer's hand raised again. I don't know if she meant to or not. I'm gonna just unmute her to see. I don't know if she meant to. Jennifer, did you want to say something? Yeah, could I? I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't actually realize I had a I had a, um, a microphone, so you did hear my baby. <laughs> I apologize. Um. Um. So I said I just to uh, elaborate my question about temperature. Um. So you guys have never actually measured the temperature downstream of those of those ponds, or you're just assuming that that uh it's, you're not going to have a raised temperature because of the outlet from the ponds. Yeah, we do have like uh, temperature uh, sensors set up upstream and downstream of the ponds to monitor the temperature change over the course of the the seasons. Uh -huh. uh, so, for example, when you look at like uh, Galloway Pond, you'll have a temperature sensor for the inflow and temperature sensor for the outflow. And in the summertime, you'll see that temperature increase. Uh, sometimes we're seeing you know three, four, five degrees Celsius change between upstream and downstream. In the winter time you don't really see a lot of change with the uh, water temperature. The dams can, uh, like a, a dam with a waterfall can actually decrease the temperature even further with heat loss occurring at the waterfall. Uh, but it's, it's very difficult for us to see that. The, um, uh, most of what we're seeing is a, is a fairly consistent temperature regime, both upstream and downstream of the structures. Okay, cool. No, that was, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. Yeah, it, like we use those little onset data loggers, and uh, those that's the best tool we found for monitoring uh, in situ uh, temperatures. Great, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Okay, I think that's about it. Okay.
Okay, excellent. Well, thank you again, Mark. Um, a reminder to everyone who's participating today that our next webinar presentation is going to be on February 10th. Uh, Normand Bergerin of INRS will be discussing the water temperature monitoring network that's being developed across eastern Canada. So registration and a list of upcoming webinars is available on the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute websites. So thank you everyone today for participating and especially to Mark for presenting and we hope you'll all join us again very soon. Thanks everyone.